Welcome to 7 Sips. Today I want to encourage three groups of people. In that first group, I'm wanting to encourage people who maybe want nothing to do with Jesus because of how some of his followers have unfortunately represented him and the gospel. I'm sorry if you have been, been ostracized or made to feel like you don't belong. The second group I want to encourage is those who feel like, you know what, I have a relationship with Jesus but I just feel really far away. And maybe that's because you've been making some decisions or made a decision in your life that doesn't seem to align with what God wants for your heart. So maybe you're carrying a little bit of guilt, maybe a little bit of shame, and feel like you can't come to him anymore. I've got some words for you. And for the third group, I want to encourage those who maybe you like the idea of Jesus. Maybe you've been to church, maybe you even raised your hand, maybe you've sang a couple of songs, but you don't fully want to give in yet because you feel like you might have to give up too much of your lifestyle that brings you some kind of pleasure or joy or fun and you feel like you're gonna to have to exchange that in order to follow Jesus. I've got some words for you too. The first thing I wanna say is that no matter what group you fall into, I wanna remind you that Jesus is still running after you. Not in this like creepy stalker kind of way, but in this really, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get my child to understand how much I love them way. And so I want you to keep that at the center of your thoughts. You know, last night I was reading about John chapter 4 in a book and something in the way the author was explaining it really stood out to me. If you're not familiar with John chapter 4, it tells the story of Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And so as far as biblical setups go, this one is already taboo for a few reasons. The first is that a man is talking to a woman, right? And this is something that during that culture and time just wouldn't be happening, right? Men and women had very separate roles and functions in society. And so if you were talking to someone of your opposite sex, it was somebody in your immediate family, right? And the second thing is that this woman happens to be a Samaritan and Jesus was a Jew and these groups hated each other, right? There's so many prejudices and, and just hate towards one another. And so the fact that Jesus is stopping to talk to somebody that they're supposed to hate is taboo number two. The third thing is that this Samaritan woman wasn't just any woman. She was a disgraced woman by the standards of their culture at that time, right? So we know from the exchange that she has with Jesus that she's been married five times. And we also know that she's visiting the well at a time where most women would not be going to the well because it was just too hot. So she was going at a time where no one else would be there, presumably to avoid being seen, to avoid you know hearing comments or stares or anything like that. She's a woman, she's a Samaritan, and she's disgraced. And all of those three things would make it so that Jesus, who is a man, who is a Jew, and who is holy, right, he is also a rabbi, would never talk to someone like this. And yet here he is going out of his way to stop his to stop his day, going in the opposite direction of where they needed to go to have this conversation with this woman anyway. Now Jesus fully understands the societal norms. He fully understands everything that's going on. He knows everything about this woman. And yet still he pushes away every single societal norm to engage in conversation anyway. I wonder if we start to think about any societal norms today that we feel people don't belong with the love of Jesus or the love of God, will we view the story in the same way? You could replace this Samaritan woman in our culture with anyone who's not supposed to mix. You wanna make the Samaritan woman a black woman? You can do that. You wanna make it a white man? You could do that. Or you wanna make it a Latino or Latina? You could do that. You wanna make it someone who identifies as gay? You could do that. You wanna make it someone of a different religion or faith? You could do that. Whoever it is that society has told you that you need to ostracize, whoever it is that society has told you that you need to push away, maybe for some of you it's a Christian. You could replace it with any person that you could think of and Jesus still pushes away the societal norms to start a conversation anyway. Why? Why would he do that? Well, because Jesus is after our hearts. He's going to push right past what religion and society have defined as acceptable to reach you. He loves you that much. You know, Jesus stood for things. I'm not saying you throw out everything that the Bible says, but I think that we sometimes misunderstand the point of Jesus' teachings and think that it's all about following the law. 
when time and time and time again, if you read about Jesus's life and you listen to the parables, you see over and over and over again that he is more concerned with mercy and justice and he is with sacrifice and following the law. And I think that that's an uncomfortable thing for people who have a lot of comfort in religion because we want to be right. We want to feel like we're doing something right. It satisfies our needs. I know the feeling, I love being right, it gives me a sense of validation. So I understand why it is easier as Christians to raise our nose at people who are where we once were. But that's not the way that Jesus would have it. Jesus was constantly going back for people who were lost, for people who were broken down by society standards, constantly going back to them. It doesn't mean that you ignore everything and that you don't help correct someone who is already walking, right? But we should not be stumbling blocks to people who are trying to come back, to people who are trying to connect by throwing all of these rules and these laws that if we're honest, we don't follow perfectly either. We can't sit there and scream at someone's choices when we're in the midst sinning as well or we have sinned as well because it makes it feel more comfortable or because there is some kind of law that maybe that you've conquered, that you've gone through, that you've broken through and now we sit and we judge others that haven't gotten there yet. That's not the way that Jesus would have done it. There's this, this pattern of thinking within the Samaritan woman, right? And I wonder if we're caught in our own patterns of thinking. Jesus invites her into this conversation, right, by asking her for a drink of water. And the Samaritan woman's first response is to throw all the societal norms back towards him, right? Aren't you a Jew? Don't you know I'm a Samaritan? What Jesus does is he pushes past that statement and continues to engage her in conversation anyway. And so Jesus invites her again further into the conversation and the Samaritan woman cites a different law. And I love that Jesus knows all about her circumstances, right? She knows that she's living this existence that would maybe cause shame in her community, right? And he still gives her worth. He still acknowledges her. And so the Samaritan woman brings up this law about her ancestors worshiping in one spot. But the Jews saying that, that the only spot to worship in is in Jerusalem. And Jesus graciously removes that boundary. Let's take a look really quickly at verse 21 through 24. It says, Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And that's what stood out to me, that his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And so what he's saying here is that he is after our hearts. He is after our hearts, not just forced, changed behavior. He's after our hearts, not just, you know, religious observances of societal norms or rules. Uh, it doesn't make you better if you if you decide to do Sabbath on a Saturday or a Sunday, if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat. And it doesn't make you better if you are black or if you are white. He's after your heart. And if your heart is showing toxicity, if out of your heart is spewing hatred, if, and if out of your heart is coming veiled attempts at religiosity, of dividing people, of putting people into spaces where you believe Jesus won't reach them, where you get angry when Jesus reaches them, then you're missing the point of Jesus. For those of you who are far away because you've misheard the gospel, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I urge you to open up the Bible and read it for yourself. You can start with the book of John. For those of you running away from Jesus because you've made a mistake, and you don't believe he'll have you anymore. He will, he will have you. Run to him, tell him your mistake, repent, repent and you will be freed. And for those of you on the edge, you wanna follow Jesus, but you don't wanna give up your life. Life will be more full than you can even ever imagine because there are a set of gifts that God wants to gift you with that he can't because you're still holding on too tightly to things that will evaporate. So come to him. 
Come to him those who are weary. Come to him those who are tired. And he will give you rest. <laughs>